Greetings, ladies and gentlemen! Welcome back to my channel! In this video, we are going to consider another piece of evidence, a crucial one, supporting my claim that the spacetime itself is nothing else than the medium for electromagnetic waves. Let's dive into it. There is one extraordinary effect that has been known in physics for quite a while now, the lens theorem effect. This effect is also known as the frame dragging effect. As it was predicted, MS by itself not only bends the spacetime, but a rotating mass should drag the spacetime along the direction of its rotation. Besides, the higher the rotation rate, the higher the effect itself. For example, the Earth makes a complete rotation around its axis in 24 hours. The rotational rate of the Earth is only a quarter of a degree per minute. It is a pretty low rate of rotation, I have to admit. Therefore, in this particular case, the influence of the frame dragging effect on the spacetime around Earth is practically unnoticeable. However, if we would take a pulsar, PSR J1748 Dash 2446 AD, for instance, the situation is completely different. The rotational rate of this pulsar is 5 times per second, and the influence of the frame dragging effect on the spacetime around it is enormous. Not even compared to Earth. As a result of it, when we want to calculate an extremely precise trajectory of a close passing object in the gravitational sphere of such fast rotating mass, we must apply additional corrections to counteract the influence of the frame dragging effect. The frame dragging effect is quite comprehensible and had been predicted a quite a while ago. Moreover, it has been confirmed recently by analyzing timing observations of a young pulsar. PSR J1141-6545, which is in a binary orbit with a white dwarf. However, there is one interesting thing directly related to the frame dragging effect itself. As the rotating mass drags the spacetime along the direction of its rotation, it literally means the spacetime itself is glued to the surface of a rotating body, in some way, of course. And right here we have a huge problem no one willing to notice. A critical error in the very basics of the physics that made us stuck where we are nowadays. I mean, in relation to the development of new physical theories and new technologies as a result. I would even say a tremendous misunderstanding of how physics works in its basics. You'll see what I'm talking about in a moment. Let's back to the frame dragging effect. On the one hand, we have the spacetime and the frame dragging effect when the spacetime itself is bound to the surface of a massive rotating body, right? But on the other hand, we have the null result of the Michelson-Morley experiment that had been carried out precisely on the surface of a massive rotating body. Still, do not see where I am going with it? Let's go deeper then and put all the pieces of a puzzle on their places. Let's find out what would happen when we set up similar to the Michelson-Morley interferometer experiment on the surface of a planet that has its own gravitational sphere of influence and considering the spacetime as a medium for electromagnetic waves. Could it be possible in this particular case to find any difference in the speed of light propagation at any possible directions, being on the surface of such a planet? I can surely say, of course it is not. And here is why. As the mass of a planet bends the spacetime, the spacetime curvature is always bound to the planet itself, right? As a result, whatever the orbital velocity such a planet has, 
whatever the speed such a planet moves through space on its orbit, the space-time curvature always follows the planet itself. Moreover, whatever the rotational rate such a planet has, the space-time itself is also bound to its surface because of the frame-dragon effect. As a result, being on the surface of a planet, it is not possible to find any difference in the speed of light propagation in any possible directions in the first place. Besides, it doesn't matter would you use an interferometer and Michelson-Morley experiment as a basis or even any other ways or methods. Just because, being on the surface of a planet, we are not only moving together with the space-time itself, with the medium for electromagnetic waves, but also are rotating together with such a medium. In this case, the speed of light will always be the same in all possible directions, since there is no movement against the medium for electromagnetic waves. There is no movement against the space-time. However, the difference in the speed of light propagation could only be detected when we would move through such a medium with a quite noticeable velocity an orbital velocity as an example. Therefore, if we would conduct the Michelson-Morley experiment on board International Space Station, for example, then we could easily detect the shift of the interference fringes in direct relation to the orbital velocity of the International Space Station itself, which exactly goes throughout the space-time, throughout the medium for electromagnetic waves on its orbit around Earth. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pretty sure now you can see for yourself why the Michelson-Morley experiment, which had explicitly been conducted on the surface of a planet, returned a zero result. Also, it becomes totally understandable why such an experiment cannot be used to detect the difference in the light speed propagation being on the surface of a planet. Moreover, being on the surface of a planet, it is not possible to detect even the presence of such a versatile medium for electromagnetic waves that the space-time is. Right, that was the easy part, wasn't it? But now we came to a hard one. When we do have a medium for electromagnetic waves return back in physics, we started to have another set of problems. For instance, the light speed itself cannot be constant and unchangeable value, as the theory of relativity says, but has to be dependent on the conditions of its medium. As the medium for electromagnetic waves is the space-time itself, as we have determined it earlier, then the speed of light has to be dependent on the conditions of the space-time, particularly on how much the space-time is bent at a specific region in space, on the total strength of gravity in that specific region, in other words. If we have any changes in the total strength of gravity, as a result of many different reasons, it should inevitably have its influence on the speed of light. As a final result, the speed of light has to correspond to the different conditions of its medium, be higher in one cases and be lower in the others. I guess I have to explain what exactly the term the total strength of gravity means before going further. What exactly I mean saying how much the space-time is bent at a particular region in space? When we would consider a region of space where there are no animous objects, the two-dimensional representation of this three-dimensional space would look like a perfect sheet without any curvature at all. However, when we have at least one massive space object in there, like a planet, for instance, 
then the space-time looks a bit different in comparison to the space-time, where there are no animus objects at all. Moreover, the higher the mass of such an object, the deeper the space-time curvature. As a result, the presence of mass changes the space-time itself, changes how much it is bent at a certain region in space. As a final result, in different regions of space, where there are various conditions of the space-time, have to be different light speeds. Nevertheless, notwithstanding how good or bad my statement is by itself, regardless of how good and detailed my explanations are, it is still only a theory, even a hypothesis if you wish. I can assume whatever I want, but at some point it would be extremely helpful to have a solid ground below feet. As a result, it is incredibly important to find a solid piece of evidence no one can refuse. On the one hand, such proof would wholly support my statement, but on the other hand, everyone can check it to confirm or refute. However, is there a way to do it? Is it even possible in the first place? How can we prove that the speed of light indeed is dependent on the strength of gravity? No worries, ladies and gentlemen, I assure you, there is at least one way to do it. To prove my statement that the speed of light indeed depends on the strength of gravity, we can use another well-documented Albert Michelson work, their measurement of the velocity of light in a partial vacuum. This experiment has been carried out at the Irving Ranch near Santa Ana, California, during the period from September 1929 to March 1933. However, I guess you would ask me why I am using the measurement of the light speed made nearly a hundred years ago. Why I am not using the most current experiments, which has been conducted with much greater precision than Albert Michelson's experiment? Well, there are several reasons for that. Firstly, despite the fact it has been done nearly a hundred years ago, no one is going to argue with its results, because this experiment had been well documented. Secondly, in this experiment no electronics had been used. All the fundamental electronics principles of work are based on the speed of light in the very essence. However, using instruments, indications of which depends on the light speed, to determine the light speed itself is a little bit controversial, don't you think? I am going to make a detailed video to explain why it is not a good idea to use an ultra-precise atomic clock, the indication of which depends on the strength of gravity, to determine the light speed, what in its turn also depends on the strength of gravity, as we will see. Thirdly, on the results of Albert Michelson's work, the whole theory of relativity is based. The essentials for the theory of relativity statement, that the light speed is unchangeable constant, is based on the result of the michelson morley interferometer experiment. Nonetheless, I have already described why the interferometer experiment wasn't able to detect any difference in the speed of light propagation a bit earlier. Therefore, using Albert Michelson's work to kick out the cornerstone of the theory of relativity, destroying the very basement for the constancy of the light speed, is extremely important to get out of the dead end where we are at the moment, where the theoretical physics is at the moment. Please, understand me in the right way. I am not too fond of the theory of relativity, it's true, mainly because it only postulates 
but does not give a clue why things are happening precisely this way, but not another. There is no single explanation why it is so. It is the exact point why I am making these videos, to explain things. But I am not saying that the theory of relativity is entirely wrong. Not at all. It does work, even using the inertial reference frames and the constancy of the light speed. It really does. The relativistic corrections are an excellent example of it. For instance, widely used GPS uses both of such relativistic corrections, absence of which would result in the awful accuracy, at least. The only problem of the theory of relativity is Oh my, what am I saying? Not actually the only one, but truly the main one, is it works quite well, but only, or even exceptionally, when you are in the sphere of gravitational influence of Earth. As soon as we moved out of it, we started to have lots of incomprehensive events, such as the flyby anomaly, or the dark stuff, or even many, many other non-predictive events I don't even want to touch in here, but we'll be surely discussing them in the upcoming videos. But enough talking, let's get started then. I want you to have a look at the next pullout of the Michelson work measurement of the velocity of light in a partial vacuum. The simple mean of all the readings for the velocity of light is 299,774 kilometers per second in a vacuum. Since the values fluctuate somewhat with the time, this mean may differ slightly from what would be obtained if observations were made continuously over an extended period. Series of measures 113 and 2654 made from February 20th to July 14th, 1931, gave 299,775 km per second. Series 1425 made from March 25 to April 3rd, 1931, gave 299,746 km per second. The fact that this mean results differs from each other and from the value 299,796 km per second obtained on Mount Wilson necessitated additional readings. Further readings were made from March 3rd to August 4th, 1932, gave a mean value of 299,775 km per second. If, however, the readings be divided into two groups with an equal number of individual determinations of the velocity, series 55110 give a value of 299,780 km per second while series 111-158 give 299,771 km per second. Readings were resumed in December 1932, giving a mean high value of 299,785 km per second, which dropped to a mean of 299,765 km per second on January 15th, and rose again to the earlier value on February 28. The mean velocity for the 75 series was 299,775 km per second. Attempts to explain these variations in velocity as a result of instrumental effects have not thus far been successful. Right, isn't it a beautiful quote? Firstly, 
it shows a specific date when this or those series of measurements were made, which will be extremely helpful in a moment. Secondly, every single series of those measurements gave different values of the light speed. Thirdly, the quote itself clearly says the variations in the determined speed of light are not the result of the measurement errors. And, as a final result, we can conclude that the speed of light is not a constant but a variable value by using the results of the experiments only. In spite of that, there is a question. What exactly caused all those variations of the velocity of light in the very experiment in the first place? Is it even possible to explain all these variations to begin with? We'll see in a moment, but now let's go back to the main question. How can we prove that the light speed is dependent on the strength of gravity? Utilizing the value of the velocity of the determined light speed and the exact time of when this or that series of determination took place, with the help of the modern tools, we can find the exact position of all the planets in our solar system on those particular dates. It will give us the possibility to determine all the distances from the Earth to the Sun and all other major planets and calculate the total strength of gravity at the exact place of the experiment. As a result, it becomes possible to check is there any correlation between the strength of gravity and the determined velocity of light. I wish Albert Michelson had the same set of instruments we have nowadays when he started his experiment. To determine the distance to the Sun and other major planets on a specific date, I used Stellarium. The Stellarium is a planetarium software that shows what you could see when you would look at the stars, but also it contains very detailed information on every single known space object in our solar system. To determine the total strength of gravity, or saying more accurately how much the space-time is bent at the place of the experiment, we can use Newton's equation. As a result, going step by step, I've completed the chart, calculated the total gravity strength at the place of the experiment and created graphs, ending up with some very interesting results I want to share. As it been said, the experiment itself consists of a series of continuous measurements. Therefore, let's have a look at the combined results of the determined light speed on a specific date and the strength of gravity I calculated. Let's start from the series 113. As you can see, on this and subsequent graphs as well, the red line represents the maximum determined value. The blue line represents the minimum determined value. And the green line represents the mean value of the speed of light, where the purple line represents the calculated strength of gravity. Unfortunately, there is not much correlation between the determined light speed and the calculated strength of gravity is seen here. Let's go to another series of measures. Series 1425 as well as series 2654 also didn't give us much correlation. However, it worth to mention that after the first 46 series of observation, the apparatus had been upgraded to eliminate the effect of any lateral shift of the rotating mirror. Also, the light beam path had been rearranged, and series 4754 had been made using this new light beam arrangement. Nevertheless, since the advantages of the setup were found to be negligible, 
the original arrangement of the prism were used for the rest of the measures. Series 55-110, as well as Series 111-158, also don't give us any noticeable correlation. As you can see by yourself, still, there is no visible correlation between the light speed and the strength of gravity at all. So, is my statement wrong? You know, at this point I really started to think I was on the wrong track. There is only one final series of measurements left, but I still couldn't see any correlations at all. With a heavy heart, I started to review the last series 159-233. Maybe here we can find the correlation, the last only hope in some way. So, as soon as I finished the graph and had a look at it, everything becomes straightforward, but in a bit opposite way than I expected. I thought the correlation should be direct, the higher the gravity, the higher the light speed. But this graph showed completely opposite thing. The space-time itself, the medium for electromagnetic waves, wasn't that simple I thought it was. Let's have a look at the graph. Can you see a correlation between the light speed and the strength of gravity here? Can't you? If you still don't see a correlation here, let's add a polynomial line to the lines that represent the calculated strength of gravity and the mean velocity line. Can you see the correlation between the strength of gravity and the light speed on this graph now? I believe you do. We can see when the strength of gravity getting higher, the speed of light is getting lower. Further, when the strength of gravity becomes constant for a while, the speed of light also had stabilized at one velocity. And even more further, when the strength of gravity getting lower, the speed of light is getting higher. Isn't it a pure beauty, ladies and gentlemen? Isn't it a solid proof we were looking for? A solid proof based on the real experiments data that the light speed is not a constant but actually depends on the strength of gravity. It is, in fact, but there is still one problem left, though. When we would take a look at the other graphs once again, we could see that in some cases the speed of light goes down when the strength of gravity also goes down. As well as on some other graphs, the unexpected opposite situation is happening. The speed of light goes up when the strength of gravity also goes up. As well as some graphs show, the speed of light stays the same, despite the strength of gravity changes. How could such a weird behavior of the light speed be explained? The only thing I can say more and less certain it is that more research is needed in this exact direction. It might well be the measurement errors at the very beginning of the experiment itself. And since the apparatus has been getting minor upgrades throughout all the series of measures to get more accurate results, the final series of measures can be considered as the most accurate one. Besides, it is the most extended series and consists of nearly half of the total observations. I think it is the very reason why I couldn't see the correlations in the previous graphs. However, it might well be that a completely different thing is happening here. To give you a bit clearer picture of what I am talking about, let's make some parallels. I love to do that, actually. We know that the speed of sound depends on the conditions of its medium. The speed of sound mostly depends on the temperature and the density of air. 
However, air pressure also plays its role here. When we have a really low pressure of air, barely enough for the sound wave to propagate, the speed of sound is also low. Then, when the pressure rises, the speed of sound also increases, until the pressure gets to the point where the speed of sound stops increasing. And finally, when the pressure gets even higher, the speed of sound gets lower again. I guess the light speed also behaves similarly. Or at least could behave similarly, if you wish. As I said, more research is needed to be done in different gravity conditions to answer such a question more thoroughly. Nonetheless, we've got the answer to the main question, as well as we've gotten a solid proof that the speed of light is not a constant, but indeed a variable value that depends on the conditions of its medium, on the conditions of the spacetime. And finally, nearly a hundred years later, we've gotten the answer of why those variations took place to begin with. I guess it is a success, ladies and gentlemen. Using the real values of the actual experiment, we have gotten our solid proof. Or at least, it would have been if there was no one more problem we will have to solve. Despite the success, regardless of having a solid proof that the speed of light is dependent on the strength of gravity, some scientists, rather relativists, would say that the passage of time depends on the strength of gravity. It is the exact manifestation of the second relativistic correction. The speed of light is constant, but the time passes differently in different gravity conditions. Therefore, all these changes in the velocity of light are nothing else than the result of the time dilation phenomenon. Nonetheless, in defiance of that, we must take a much closer look at the time dilation phenomenon itself. We have to understand, are all the variations in the light speed determined in the result of the measurement of the velocity of light in a partial vacuum experiment, could occur as the result of the influence of the time dilation phenomenon, take into account widely accepted constancy of the light speed. Or they occurred as the result of the influence in the light speed itself caused by the different conditions of its medium, various gravity conditions to be specific. We'll see in the next video. Thanks for watching and have a good day. Bye bye for now. And please take the extra care these weird days. Cheers, ladies and gentlemen.